Hello, everybody, and welcome back to yet another spooky episode of The Cup Two Head <laughs> Reviews, brought to you by Cup of Hemlock Theater. This time, Brian and I went back to Elders Theater to talk all about their newest production, or at least a remounting of a of their production of The House on Poe Corner, written by Michael O'Brien and Eric Wolf, with songs, aka the Grim Warbles, by Kathy Dutosti. No Sadie, I would assume. Sorry, no Sadie? Oh, cool. yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll no Sadie. Kathy No Sadie. And this time it was performed by Mari Bab and Eric Wolf. And this will be running at Red Sand Castle Theater until April the 21st, 2024. So there we go. So, Ryan, welcome back once again. Another yes. fun episode of The Cup is Upon Us. Indeed. Happy to always yes. come back here. You and I have a long track record of talking about Eldritch shows. They're always that a good time. Do. So yes. happy to, to do yet another one of these. Yes, yes, indeed. And where would you say this one ranks for you uh, amongst our other Eldritch shows? And what is in your cup today? Okay, I'll start with the cup. Um, so since this is a show that um, deals with kind of spooky tales from childhood and mm -hmm. features characters whose most recognizable instantiations have been heavily branded by Disney. I yes. chose to use a cup that also fits ha, that theme. Ha. I don't have a Winnie the Pooh cup, but I do have Chip from Beauty and the Beast back Brilliant. to the cupboard with you. You know, speaking of inanimate objects that are brought to life through the yes. magic of wizardry and or puppetry, yes. it seemed appropriate. So I have uh, my chip cup. Tell me about your cup and then we'll talk about our, our rankings, I suppose. All right. <laughs> In my cup today, I have some strawberry banana orange crystal light. Mm. Nice kind of spooky red colors. Kind indeed, of very blood-like uh, cask of Amontillado, mm -hmm. indeed. Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, oh, and I have coffee in my chip mug. Oh, very good. Uh, yes, I, I was so excited to tell you about the mug that I forgot to describe its contents. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you also got kind of that like purplish red color once again. You're giving that kind of blood-like color today, too. Yeah, totally planned. <laughs> totally planned, totally planned, totally planned. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, Ryan, so... <laughs> Where was this show ranking for you? Yeah, I don't know. As I've said in other episodes of this, it's hard for me to kind of think of in terms of favorites rankings. Mm -hmm. I The last Eldritch show that we reviewed was uh, Macbeth, The Tale Told by an Idiot. Which That's a was, tough one to top. Yeah, uh, and like, you know, at the time I said I'm reluctant to describe it as my favorite, but I kind of said objectively, I think it's the best Eldritch show we've seen. It's just what a tour de force that was and probably the most impressive thing I've ever seen this company achieve. And it also got me thinking about the entire way we conceptualize Shakespeare in this country. So it, that's a pretty high bar to clear. This yes. one, I enjoyed a lot of fun stuff as we will unpack. I would say probably middle of the pack ranking in the mm -hmm. whole Eldritch canon. I think if you've never seen an Eldritch show before, this is almost like a platonic ideal, perfect example of check this out and it will let you know if this is a vibe of a company you would enjoy. But yeah, it's... I like it as much as pretty much all of them and hard for me to sort of numerically rank them. I don't know if you'd like to get more precise with your own ranking. Ah, uh, well, once again, I also really loved the Mackers one, Till Told by an Idiot that we saw last. And just like, you know, once again, that play just stimulated so much good creative juices where it's like, okay, what other shows could be done in this Eric style? But this one, I will say, is probably a close second. It hmm. may bump up to first, depending on the day. Okay. Because this one was really, once again, the, the fun, creative way to get into Edgar Allan Poe. And it's A.A. A. Milnes, right? Who, who, yeah, A.A. Milnes. Yeah. 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 So, you know, like, just that mindset is just so wonderful. Because, you know, it's, it's one of those things where... You, you, you never think to combine, you know, death of Poe with Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> but when you put them together with Eric in his creative brain and his puppets, it just <laughs> clicks. Yeah. And then I'm like, OK, well, what, OK, like, could we not do like a like Dickensian like I, I, I story? Kind of, kind of almost like either a Nicholas Nickleby or an Oliver Twist-esque <laughs> puppet show. 
Well, we did. You and I reviewed Ronnie Burkett's Little Dickens, which was I right. guess, a, a very different style of puppetry. But very different we did style see a, of puppet. A yeah. whimsically puppet infused Christmas Carol, which I guess if right. Eldritch were to do it, the eyes would be a lot more bloodshot and things would yes. be a lot more macabre. But otherwise, yeah. I think the vibe I think, would be similar. I think an Oliver Twist done by Eric with his puppets would be very funny. Yes, because that is a very dark book if you actually read it and get and don't just watch the really good musical adaptation that was done by Lionel Bart back in the day. But no, like this was a lot of fun. I mean, Ron, why don't you give us a bit of a plot summary in case people don't know what this show entails and kind of what stories they were pulling for, for, from the Poe canon? Yeah, so it's basically, yeah, the the elevator pitch for this piece is it's Edgar Allan Poe meets Winnie the Pooh, that the title, The House at Poe Corner, is a riff yeah. on the A.A. Milne book of Pooh short stories, The House at Pooh Corner, which mm-hmm. is, was actually my favorite as a kid of the whole Winnie the Pooh canon. It's the it's actually like the sad one where there's the subtext of Christopher Robin is growing up and is going to have to go to school and leave the Hundred Acre Wood. And that's sort of floating in the background until you start sobbing in the very last story. They didn't necessarily go through the entire patterning of that for reasons that we I guess we could talk to in a moment. But uh, yeah, it's very much playing off the pun of, hey, Winnie the Pooh, Edgar Allan Poe, these things already sound like they can go together and they found really creative ways of doing so. So I guess the framing device that we're dealing with here is that there's two fellas, brothers, siblings of some kind, hard to say, yeah. named Edgar and Alan, played by uh, Eric Wolf and Marie Bob, who, yeah, these two mustachioed fellas who are, I guess, I guess they're supposed to both be Edgar Allan Poe as Well, it kind of reminds children. me of when they did Muppet's Christmas Carol, where Gonzo mm-hmm. was Dickens and then Rizzo was kind of like his sidekick. I know when they went to do Muppet's Treasure Island, their original plan was to have Gonzo and Rizzo, the rat once again, team up and they would be Jim and then the sidekick Hawkins. So right. like Jim Hawkins. Yeah. So we kind of did it that yeah. way. Yeah. But then they so, just felt, no, we need a live action human being with them. So. <laughs> Makes sense. So yeah, yeah, so in this case, we have our two live action human being narrator protagonists sort of reenacting these stories with their dolls or puppets. Mm-hmm. Very much how you can sort of imagine that the the Pooh stories are really just Christopher Robin imaginatively playing with his toys and then figuring that he's actually in the Hundred Acre Wood. Depends on how fantastical you want to assume the Pooh stories have always been or are they more an allegory for childhood yeah. play? But the fact that both of these Again, it's hard to describe them as children, but they have a childlike energy, but they are mustachioed like Poe. Yes. The, the fact that they both imbue the spirit of Edgar Allan Poe mm-hmm. means that the stories they reenact with their stuffies are very much going to be yeah, gruesome and horrific. Yes. And they riff off plots that are simultaneously pulled both from the greatest hits yes. of Edgar Allan Poe, but also t- pulling in classic Winnie the Pooh stories. I think the best... Yes. No, I don't necessarily need to go through the whole boop, boop, boop. This is all the ones they did. But I think the best perfect crystallization of that is that we have the Cask of Amontillado story mm. mixed with who getting stuck in the honey tree story and the fact yes. that so it's the rabbit character, Jack Hare, in this instance, uh, trapping Pooh inside the hole in the wall to murder Starting him. him to death. It's just like, it's like, you know, I, I lean forward when I realized what was going on in this vignette. Yeah. I'm like, okay, I see what we're, what's yeah. happening here. This is brilliant. So yeah, it's absolutely mm-hmm. a delight, even if you're not familiar with any of the source material that is being brought together from either of the two authors here, you'll still have a fun time with these and you'll get an extra rush of recognition if you are familiar with both. And you'll see how it's not a straightforward version of either of the two authors that we're dealing with here that you, there's lots of creative things to pull from. Uh, Yeah. And I think we have our, (laughs) I guess, off brand version of all of the Pooh characters, which is really funny because, oh yeah. So just to go through them really quickly, our lead is Poe Bear, not Pooh Bear. And that's the sort of central (laughs) and Allan Poe-ness of it all. His best friend, the pig is not Piglet, he's Cutlet. Uh, which yes. is uh, hilarious. We have uh, what else? There's the Tigger one. Yeah, the Tigger one. I forget what they called him. It was a danger cat or something. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Although his puppet There's was like a monkey. rabbit or Jack yeah, Hare. Rabbit, rabbit was Jack Hare. There was uh, the owl. Eeyore one. Oh, Eeyore one was Gloom Hoof. Uh, the yeah. Mule. He started uh, making a joke off the whole. Yeah, the whole, how he's the horse hoof. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. Horse uh, oh, there's uh, the owl one. That was the, the owl one was the raven. Night Fowl, who of course was yeah. a raven instead of an owl yeah. because of Poe. 
Yes. Uh, and then instead of Kanga and Rue, we have Walla and B, different marsupials from the Antipodes. Yes. <laughs> um, except that Walla is dead and mummified. And, yeah. And <laughs> B dark. is a little kind of off his rocker a little bit, thinking yeah. that his mother is still alive. So yeah, I think that was the main core cast of, of who characters we had here. Yes. And yeah, like there's, there's more we could say post spoiler, but I think I don't feel like any of that is really spoiling. It's just yeah. that's a fun vibe that you are encountering here. And yeah. Yeah, if that sounds like fun, I encourage people to check this show out. It was really a perfect version of itself. Yeah, I mean, like, I'll just double down on what you said. I mean, like, yeah, I, I, as I, as you said, I think the best example of where they really kind of clicked with the with the two concepts was the Casa Macliato, mm-hmm. who and Ra- who who getting stuck in Rabbit's hole, so mm-hmm. they kind of have to starve Pooh out to pull him mm-hmm. out. Like, mm-hmm. like you're right. Like the minute I saw that happen, I was like, okay. I'm really on board now. <laughs> and I mean, the fact that they then have the songs that are very much kind of... The warbles. Dis- yeah, <laughs> yes, the warbles that are very kind of Disney-esque <laughs> in their... I mean, their styling is great. And then this is one of these shows that ha- that where Eric is not by himself, but he has <laughs> a partner yeah. on stage. And the last time I think you said we had that was... Requiem the, for the, a Gumshoe. The, yeah. The film noir one that they did. Yeah, Requiem for a Gumshoe, which Mari Ball was also in. And yeah, so a, she played kind of the, the, femme, the femme fatale. Yeah, and it's and a myriad of other puppet characters, which is really fun. Yeah. yeah, like they work very well together. They have a great duo dynamic. They're, they both have such a, a great plethora of fun voices yeah. that they're able to bring to all the puppets. I think the cast is pretty evenly divided between the two of them. And yet yeah, mm-hmm. each character was so different from every other one. And the two of them yeah. Yeah, really riff off each other in an excellent way. Yeah, I, I mean, it's so neat to see... Because you and I are so used to Eric just kind of holding his own mm-hmm. for the whole show, but then to have him play off someone it really does give him a really fun dynamic that you don't always get when it's just him. And the energy was just a little bit different. It had a bit more pep <laughs> to it, where like you could tell he was really having fun riffing with Mari in, in these interactions with like uh, Ho Bear and Cutlet, like the two of them being able to go back and forth and give each other side looks, and like it was a lot of fun. So, so so I thoroughly enjoyed their chemistry together on stage. I, I thought it was really, really well done. Mm-hmm. Indeed. So, yeah. All right. Well, Should Ryan. We go with the spoiler quote, tale? Yeah, exactly. Shall we head into the spoiler zone and quote the raven? Spoiler <laughs> alert. Quoth, caca, night caca. owl, not raven. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. So there's a spoiler raven quoting on the screen. Yeah. What but do you before we do that, we'll, do, we'll, 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 we'll just remind everyone the house at Poe Corner runs at Red St. Castle Theater until April the 21st, 2024. And get your tickets to get on out and see this one. This is a great outing for both adults and families. I mean, maybe not young children because they may find this a little bit too creepy, but maybe like eight and up. I would say sure. probably a decent <laughs> age there. But no, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Head on out. See it. You won't, you'll, you'll be disappointed. It's another great Eric outing at Red St. Castle Theater. Mm-hmm. Great. So now... Yeah. Kaka, quoth Ka-ka. the night foul. Spoiler alert! Kaka! <laughs> okay, so where do you want to start? Oh my goodness. Well, Ryan, just like last time, what was your favorite puppet? Oh, okay. I think it's a tie for me. Mm-hmm. And it, and in the spirit of fairness, I have one favorite Eric puppet, one favorite Mari puppet. Love it. So for Eric, it was Jack Hare. Jack Hare was my favorite. <laughs> he was just such like, a perfect poe protagonist in mm-hmm. a way um, you know the, the voice like i can't even describe just this sort of like effete intellectual who <laughs> you, know, you would twitch twitch and it was, yeah. Uh, yeah it was kind of it was clearly taking enough cues from the voice actor who voices rabbit in the mm-hmm. disney boo stuff but really making it his own and uh, sort yeah. of perfect and like constantly on the brink of insanity and yeah. it just yeah it was such a perfect fit for the vibes of this so yeah jack Hare definitely was my one of my favorites. And then the other one was, yeah, Night Fowl, the owl counterpart who was our raven, which Mari Boyce did. Just like the completely preposterous female intellectual voice that's like very like British. It's hard for me to imbue it properly, you know, using all the big words that the other characters yeah. then turn to the audience and don't know what they're saying. I just thought, yeah, she was such a hoot. So uh, ha, hoot. Hoot. no pun intended. Yeah. So those two are my favorites. Uh, I think I know which one you're going to say and I'll let you say it yourself. All right. I have two. Okay. So first one is the Tigger puppet. <laughs> that's what I figured. I, I love Tigger as a character and just the way they reinterpreted him 
in this one and just the way like they kept making jokes about how Tigger's supposed to look because like it starts mm-hmm. off like a little fur ball, yeah, and then ends up kind of like this big hulk like mm-hmm. figure. And I mean, in fact, they and they, and they did kind of get that. No, no, Tigger, Tigger's Tigger's a wonderful thing that lisping kind of voice. Mm-hmm. You know, they kind of had that kind of voice going with the Tigger character. I, I, but I wish I could remember that character's name. Yeah, it was, uh, something cat or yeah. apologies, terror yeah. cat or I yeah, thundercat, something like that. <laughs> Thundercats, no, yeah. I, I, something like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, but the other one was uh, the Rue character. The, oh yeah, B Walla B. and B. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's... Walla and B. I mean, just like the kind of like almost cowardly line, like <laughs> put them up, put them up, like it's <laughs> beating up on everyone all the time. Yeah, it was always and... just great comedy. And what was so fun about him was how, like, he had the essence of a small, disturbed child, but, like, yes. the voice of, like, an Australian adult man, <laughs> yeah. which was, like, so Kind of crocodile dungeon. Yeah, yeah, very, very much. Now that's a knife, which I thought yeah. suited. Yeah, it was such, like, a, a yeah. weird juxtaposition within this character that, like, represents childhood innocence, but will also stab you if you say anything about his dead mom. <laughs> yeah. Who's <laughs> not really My mother's dead. not dead! <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, all of the puppets were so good, so funny. I feel like, you know, yeah. in picking our favorite side characters, we neglected to get specific into our Poe Bear and Cutlet, the leads of the show, but yeah, they right. were also great. Well, I mean, so, what, well, I mean, there's yeah. so much fun. I mean, and I, 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 I mean, those two are just a hoot as well. I mean, mm-hmm. I, 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 I mean, just that dynamic is so iconic that you can picture Winnie the Pooh and Piglet <laughs> together. So the fact they do this really disturbed version of them where like, you know, yeah, Cutlet kind of saying all about this creature, the the wallaby. Uh, no, the wallaby was uh, the kangaroo. No, uh, sorry. So, so, so it was like. A... Yeah, but I forget what they called the bumble or uh, bumblebee yeah. was what they called honey. I don't know. There's yeah, so but, many... yeah, bumblebee was honey. <laughs> they had like a different word for everything, which was very yes. fun. I forget. But what basically, yeah, it was kind of like this but... big creature. Yeah. And Cutlet's like, no, no, they exist. And Pooh's like, no, they don't. <laughs> so then ultimately, it's like they spend a whole episode like shunning him. And it's like <laughs> so much fun. But like just that weird di- dynamic that they just kind of took a classic pairing and just kind of yeah. twisted it just enough that it became its own thing. Yeah. And something I'll add to that is like the characters are all so well defined in these shows that like baffles me how much like thought they put into these Things that are really just like silly parodies, but they really like give these characters texture and uh, uniqueness in a lot of way. And something that I thought was so interesting about this one is how Poe Bear, instead of being our lovable dopey protagonist that we're so familiar with, he has such a temper and a vindictive streak that comes out constantly throughout this. He's like the most unlikable protagonist you could possibly imagine. And and yet it works so well because, yeah, you're not supposed to like it. Well, I mean, Poe Bear in the first scene when he wakes up and he finds the cat in the honeypot, he kills the cat. (laughs) Like right away, you're like, oh. It's the opposite of the screenwriting truism of save the cat. The first thing we see him do is murder a cat. And okay, this isn't someone we're supposed to endear ourselves too i yeah that also comes from an edgar Allan poe story the black cat which uh is, ah. so yes uh that's you know chef's kiss everything is so brilliant in yeah. all of this and yeah. yeah like he's so mean to cutlet who yeah who also you know is a bad person and he yes he enacts the telltale heart story the telltale tale as they call yes. it here because he kills gloom who the eeyore equivalent because the tail keeps swooshing yeah <laughs> yeah it's like oh my god just sorry i could go on and on about each little detail of this but it's yeah. so brilliant like once again just taking those things and just twisting them a little bit and you get this entirely new thing that like like every episode we talk about how eric should do like a, a web series mm-hmm. this is one i think would make a really good web series right because you could, cause just like you said with like the raven one that you and jill saw mm-hmm. um Oh yeah, Family Crow, which that wasn't Eric himself. The like, Elf ah. produced its run in Toronto, but Got that it. was I forget the Adam Francis Crew, I think his name was. But yes. But, but similar yeah. thing where it's like this cast of characters doing something. And like you could create little 20 minute vignettes mm-hmm. with these characters and have a lot of fun and people would get right into them. And, uh, and so like just so good. Just so so good. Yeah. And I mean, I will say like something that was brought to our attention before we went mm-hmm. was that Eric was a bit under the weather. And right. there was concern about, you know, could he do it tonight? And then all of a sudden we get the email saying, nope, we're a go. So Ryan and I went and I got to I got to hand it to him. Like, you know, as Ryan said, if we hadn't been told what was going on, 
I would have just thought Eric was playing it very macabre and lower energy because he's playing an Edgar Allan Poe person. Yeah, I mean, like, it fits the show so well. Yeah. And that's the thing, like, I would have never thought for a second that he was unwell. He's such a trooper. It's an an amazing performer. We've seen him be amazing in so many contexts. Yeah. And, like, I didn't even feel like his energy was that low. He brought so much vigor to each character. Well, it's kind of like, there was vigor, but at the same time, like, I could tell he was a bit reserved, but I was like, if I didn't know about the voice, (laughs) I would have just thought, he's playing reserved because he's in the world of Edgar Allan Poe. And this is a very macabre and, you know, dour setting. So he's not kind of going really big and muppety. He's mm-hmm. kind of keeping it as tight as possible this time around. Yeah, and I think it's fair. One thing I will say about his voice is isn't because he was sick. I just thought his accent as Edgar was very funny. Because, like, I'm trying to even pin down what it was. It sounds like a very southern drawl. But, yes. like... <laughs> Edgar Allan Poe is from Baltimore, which I get Maryland sort of straddles the line between North and South, but like, I, I don't think that's what Poe sounded like, and yet it still evokes what you imagine Poe sounded yeah. like, which is very funny, and yeah, it, it suited the character really well, and the historical possible accuracy aside, and we don't have it, as far as I know, any recordings of what Poe actually sounded like, he kind of predates that sort of technology by a little bit. But yeah. yeah, I just thought, yeah, his voice was very distinct in those like framing device scenes, but then such a remarkable contrast mm-hmm. to all of his puppet characters, which were so good. And yeah, again, Jack yeah. was my favorite. So fantastic. And yeah, like I know there's, you know, all this rhetoric and conversations about toxic, the show must go on mentality that mm-hmm. people are unwell, that we should give more grace for those kinds of things. And I definitely I support all of that discourse as well. But I just think yeah, Eric did as a trooper when he was feeling unwell with his voice under the weather. I hope he took good care of it. And, but yeah, excellent job. And we would have never thought anything of it. Would, ne- would never have even known. Mm-hmm. Was there any post story that they didn't cover that you would have liked them to cover? Hmm. That's interesting. I, I actually hadn't thought about that. I guess we didn't really get a proper Raven adaptation. That's the one I was going to say too. I was <laughs> yeah. like, because I, 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 I we because we were recording this two days later, but I was like, we never got a proper quote the Raven Nevermore. Yeah, they made references story. to that, and we had a Raven as a character in there. But yeah, I yeah. think one of the funny warble songs was about Lenore and kind of took things yeah. from the, the Raven, although. So there's Lenore is a name that shows up in a lot of Poe's works and especially some of his poems. So I I would have to think back to, was it specifically taking Mm -hmm. things from the Raven itself? But yeah, I I sort of see the the warbles were fun. They were kind of like little interstitial songs more often than not. And I I feel like it was a way to just kind of shoehorn in a lot more Poe material than the main segments allowed. But yeah, I, I do think, yeah, I don't feel like we got a good Raven adaptation in here. Not that we needed one and we had so many fun stuff. So on the subject of like slipping in little details in addition to, you know, doing a good coverage of the Poe canon. I also just like ways that even little Pooh stories that they weren't mm-hmm. adapting or things about Pooh that they they slipped in little references for those yeah. who know to find them. It was a silly example, but at one point... If Poe Bear says to Cutlet, remember when we were six? And I'm like, that's the name of an A.A. Milne poetry book, when we were six. <laughs> so, yeah, just like little things like that. They really, yeah, they have, you know, when Eric and Michael were writing this together, they clearly like went through like, okay, let's put in as many Easter eggs as possible. Yes. Because if the Poe fans and the Milne fans are going to lose their minds when they hear all of this. Yeah. How about you? Was there, aside from the Raven, was there anything else that you felt was missing? See, uh, unfortunately, like I read like a like a, a kind of the collection of Poe work when I was a child, like mm-hmm. young, like yeah. teenager, teenager. Same. Yeah. So trying to remember all of them is really tricky. Like that's the thing. They're like, uh, like obviously you remember the tale of, of the Castellano where the person gets buried alive in the wall. Mm-hmm. There's the Telltale Heart where it's the heart under the floorboard. So they covered those. But yeah, yeah. the only one I was really familiar with was the raven and i was like mm-hmm. quote the raven nevermore like i i i, 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 I was right like, i almost thought when they get eaten at the end of that last story mm-hmm. they were going to do something in the dark with the flashlight where it's like yeah. they do some type of version of that like as, as, as a finale piece because something in there like that but once again like 
I would have gone another half an hour with the more oh, for sure. stories. Oh, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I don't really feel like we got a follow the House of Usher version in here. Mm. They keep mentioning Mr. Usher, who I kind of assume is to be our Christopher Robin counterpart. Right. Anytime they allude to the absence of mm. Mr. Usher. But yeah, we didn't really get that yeah. particular story to my recollection. Did and you see follow the, follow the House of Usher on Netflix yet? I did not. Is it good? Oh, that's a fun one. Okay, Lots of Poe deaths. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so... Again, Poe wrote a lot of things. They cover most of the greatest hits in here. Yeah. The only ones that we're thinking of, oh, they didn't do this, are just other greatest hits they, they yes. didn't. But yeah, it's a it's a fairly tight short show. Like what was it like an hour and a half that you can't eighty five minutes. So. It, yeah, so not even an hour and a half. So yeah. yeah, they can't cover it all. On the subject of, I guess, just what they cover and you know the length of it too. I felt like it maybe ended more abruptly than I would have liked. I yeah, think, I agree. Yeah, we get to the. Something that I guess maybe I feel like wasn't paid off enough is there was a lot of interesting sibling bickering between Edgar and Alan. They yes. kept, you know, one of them would keep getting spooked and they would have to abruptly end the stories and then the other would have yeah. to jolly them back into it. On one hand, I didn't feel like there was a good consistency about who was the Frady cat and who was the braver one who's jolling along. It seemed like they were almost yeah. completely interchangeable, which is maybe part of the joke too because of how they're yes. costumed and the way they're behaving. But it might have been nice if there was like some kind of arc within the framing device itself that could have yeah. given some sort of payoff in the ending. Maybe one of them is always the brave one and the other is always scared. And then there's a reversal, like a pointed right. reversal of that at the end would be funny and some sort of big kind of conclusion. But I felt like we got the final story inside the belly of the beast. And then I was surprised that the puppets were already bowing. It was over. I thought we would at least go yeah. back to our sort of main duo there. I don't, I don't know yeah. if you had other thoughts about this too. No, I agree with you. I mean, like, I'm mean, like, this was the one where like, you know, they walked off and it went to black and I, everybody kind of just stood there for a minute and did the, <laughs> yeah. and then all of a sudden it became clear that it was the end, but like, you know, I would have loved a, 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 a bit of a resolution with Poe with po and Cutler where it's almost like, you know, at the end of every, Whose story they walk off down the honey, like mm -hmm. kind, of, kind of hunted down the 100 acre wood road again, off into another adventure. Like he could have done something like that or had some type of resolution with the brothers. Like, yeah, I, I, I do think this story needed this show needed a bit more of a button to really kind of, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's probably part of the reason why discussing the ranking from earlier, I'm reluctant yes. to put this one at the very top of the list because there are things like that I'd like to see ironed out. I know this one has been produced before. They have like, you know, John Kaplan pull quotes on their website. So clearly this is from a while back. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'm not sure if this is exactly the same show that they staged previously. I wouldn't have seen it in an earlier right. version, but I do think there is still room to develop this one and refine it a little bit and then maybe possibly make it one that I would say, yes, this is my favorite Eldritch show, but right now it's a little too rough around the edges in some ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 you know, like I concur with you on that one, where we're like, where once again, like the Macros one is such a hard one to top, but like this mm -hmm. is a definitely a close Second, just because it does have so many great elements and su such sharp writing that that it does definitely hold itself. But yeah, I, I do think the ending could have been a bit tighter, you know, a bit more concise at the end there to kind of really push it to that next level and give us a nice clean ending there. Uh, did you have a favorite Warble song? Oh, man, I, I struggle to the Warble sort of all blended together. Yeah, in my head. I think the shunning cutlet one is probably the one that stands out the most yes. because it was so prominently featured within one of the main stories and not yes. just an interstitial thing between stories. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and also, I guess the gloom hoof song was pretty funny, too. Yeah, it's yeah, I struggle to to find them in my head, sort of, especially a few days later to be like, oh yeah, this one was the best, but I thought those two sort of stood out. Did you have one in addition or another one you'd like well, to Well, the gloom hoof one was one that yeah, I was sure. humming on my way home. On the okay, yeah. I was like, well, maybe I shouldn't hum this. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and it's again, if we're talking about the ways that the poo stuff maps so perfectly onto the post yeah. stuff, is that, yeah, Eeyore is a clinically depressed donkey who, yes. you know, is a fit so perfectly into the world of Poe where everybody has some kind of neuroses and yeah. is contemplating the existential dread of their situation. But yeah, Eeyore already feels like a Poe character and fits so well within it. One thing that I guess I'm also just thinking of, and I'm not saying this is a critique by any means, but two sort of trademark elements that we see in so many of these Eldritch shows don't seem to have been present here. One of them less so audience participation and magic. Yeah. But there was a little bit of magic tricks near the beginning. Very, and yeah. But very usually, limited though. 
Yeah, and I know we've talked about like, oh, do we always need so many magic tricks? Is it the main point of these shows or is it distraction from the main point? This one, I think, yeah, there was just enough of it to be like, oh, remember, Eric's a very talented magician, but it yes. wasn't. It certainly wasn't the focus point, and I don't know. I, I, I'm fine with it. I just don't. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, like that's something like I, did, I I didn't find myself missing it because he Eric had Mari to play off of, and these mm-hmm. stories alone were just so well written and compelling and driving that like I was like. Okay, we're good. Yeah, I guess, I, and I, I would agree with that in general. My kind of just thought about it is why do we even need the little bit we got if it's not going to be the main point, mm-hmm. especially since they put the joke in there about how, you know, it was a sequence of quick tricks all in a row. Like if you clap after each one, we're going to be here all night. Yes. And, but then that was, I think, the to my recollection, the only episode in it where we got any magic whatsoever. And it didn't end in like a climax of the magic mm-hmm. trick because we were told to not applaud it. So even when it got to what felt like the resolution of the trick, it was like, okay, moving on. And it it like, yeah, something about the way, even though that was a funny joke in the moment, like don't applaud for everything. It didn't seem to give the magic enough of a payoff in its own right to almost justify its inclusion in this beyond the fact that, hey, it's an outro show. Eric wants to do a magic trick at some point. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know, mixed feelings about it. And I know we often have mixed feelings about how the magic is integrated within these shows, but this one was a little different because of how minimal it was. It was minimal and I was a-okay with it because the stuff was just so compelling on its own. I was like, (laughs) all right. I mean, like, if you could, if you want to weave a little, if you want to, if you want to weave a little bit, like just a little bit of it in, because I remember there's the shot glass Mm -hmm. trick that that you were talking about with the balls and all that type of fun stuff. Then it was like, okay, great. All right. So, so I was ready for more, but like when we didn't get more, I was like, okay, Mm -hmm. Poe and Pooh are standing together here and they are just driving this piece on its own. Yeah. And audience participation too, which often is a direct counterpart to the magic that, you know, in order to verify that these tricks are really happening, that's usually a way that the audience participation is drawn in. I don't know. Did you have any thought about like, there was actually, to my recollection, zero audience participation. There was zero. Yeah. I was okay with that. Once again, like, I think it's just a story dependent where it's like, Mm -hmm. and and especially because, especially because in this particular version, Eric's got a partner. Mm -hmm. He doesn't need the audience participation because he's got his partner literally with him on stage. Right. Uh, so it's one of those things where it's like, all right, this is like, like, like this is kind of the, the setup we're doing this time around. This is a bit more of a traditional piece. Let's do it. I mean, I, I was having no problems. I was just having yeah. a grand old time overall. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. And you know me, I, I love when yeah. shows have audience participation. I don't love being called upon to participate. I was about to say, you don't like uh, being called upon. No, but I, I do love it. Like part of the fun of these shows is, you know, the way people are brought into the participation. Yeah, yeah like and I, I'm not harping on this as a critique by yeah. any means. It's more like we've, how many elder shows that we reviewed at this point is more just, oh, we're noticing patterns across. So these are the things to opine on, <laughs> I guess, regarding mm-hmm. these types of shows now that we've seen so many of them. But yeah, I don't have a problem with it either. And I, you know, I said when you're like, oh, where should we sit? And I'm like, let's go further back to risk, to avoid the risk of being called yep. upon. So, and it wasn't a concern here. So if you are someone who maybe avoids Eldritch shows because you're trepidatious about audience participation, this You're is good. the one for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just watch. Eric's going to watch this and now purposely get audience participation oh, involved man. in it just to Bait mess with switch. us. <laughs> just to mess yeah. with us, but we're, we will not be the recipients of that, but we'll seem like fools for misdescribing this show. Yeah. Any other like last thoughts or other things that you? No, I I think we've covered everything. I mean, like, yeah. we've covered the warbles, we've covered the puppets, we've covered Eric and, and Mari. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, we haven't shouted out. We've talked about the pups a lot. We haven't shouted out Melanie McNeil, who designs all the puppets. And oh, true. The visual, always excellent work. The eyes yes. are ever so bloodshot. And as we've talked about the puppets, we loved ourselves. Of course, this one, yeah, was an excellent use. And yes. using characters like the Pooh characters who are already kind of puppets, mm-hmm. even though we're most familiar with them in animation, but they are essentially a child playing with their stuffies. <laughs> that of all the shows, this is what that perfectly lends itself to the aesthetics of puppetry in this way and the fact that there's such grim and gruesome looking versions of those puppets the throwing of the the red fabric feathery things for the blood is always a fun addition here yeah (laughs) Um, oh and i I guess this is kind of fits on the theme of the puppetry too is i love the recurring motif throughout this of unmurdering people and that's bring them back right away yeah which it, you know, it's just, I guess that's how the metaphysics of this world works, that somebody can yeah. be murdered and then unmurdered, which is the perfect way to 
bring back characters <laughs> without having the finality of murder, but yeah. all, you still get all the fun of murder in this. And it, but it also suits the puppet aesthetic so well that, yeah, you imbue life into the object mm-hmm. for the moment that, and then it's, you know, it can be killed and it is no longer has life in it. And then it can be brought back because it is not living flesh in any way. It is something that becomes alive when you make it alive. So this, yeah, this tagline that kept coming back of unmurdering someone fits really well and also feeds into the way these characters view their own finite time on this mortal coil and their mortality because, uh, yeah, they know that they can be gruesomely murdered at any point, but that is not necessarily the end. end. Yeah, and it... (laughs) A, a, a Poe world is maybe cheapened by the fact that death is not final, but it makes a comedy version of the Poe world so much yes. more potent in that way. Mm-hmm. So I loved it. I love it. I love it. Well, on that note, Ryan, I think we can wrap ourselves out. Yes. Um, yes once means. again, this show runs until April the 21st, 2024. Get your tickets at Red Sand Castle Theater or Eldritch Theater's Instagram page. I know they have links to the yeah, we'll, tickets as we'll, well. Links in the bottom yeah. of this too. Yep, so check that on out. And Ryan, before we go, where can people find and follow you? Uh, Yeah, no need to find and follow me personally, but if you like me and hearing about my theater thoughts, you can follow The Cup. That's the show you're tuning into right now. It's Mm -hmm. at COH Theater on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. It is Cup of Hemlock Theater on YouTube, Cup of Hemlock Theater podcast in the podcast places. That's where you go. How about you, Mac? Where can people find and follow you? Yeah, if I follow me at Mackenzie Horner on social media platforms, you can follow my Musical Antics over at Before the Downbeat, a musical podcast, where both Ryan and Jill have, have appeared on episodes, so check those on out. And other than that, we will see you all in our next episode, which will be coming out on Friday. Mm-hmm. Yes. Exciting. Yes, Cheers. Ryan and Jill will be on that one. So we'll see you on that episode. It's a big week. <laughs> it is a big week. We have a few this month. Yes. So Tune stay tuned. Cheers. All right. Cheers. Bye. Quoth the Raven. Evermore.